coming. Yep, so I had my mouse on the wrong section. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm pretty happy to be here this afternoon because I get to talk about two of my favourite things. One of them is wetlands and the other one is water bugs. Um, so I thought I'd start off by talking about what is a wetland. I kind of think a wetland is anything that's bigger than a puddle and smaller than a lake. So it could be a swamp, a bog, a fern, a marsh, a wet meadow, any of these sort of things. Usually I think a wetland is less than one metre deep. So if I'm standing in a wetland in the middle of a wetland, my belly button will be dry. Next slide, please. Around here, I live at Wycliffe and I know um, we were meant to be at Woolora today. Um, around here, a lot of our wetlands actually occur in agricultural um, places. So in these photos, you can see some uh, different places, different wetlands in my area that I've photographed this winter. And you can see that there's actually some crops trying to grow in the wetlands. These are wetlands that are sometimes wet and sometimes dry. And it's really important that we um, figure out how to balance growing crops and taking care of our wetlands as well. The middle photo at the top is actually a drain right through the middle of a wetland near Cross Bridge. And that, that um, uh, wetland is being, uh, that drain is uh, taking some of the water off the agricultural land and putting it into the wetland. So we can still have some productivity, agricultural productivity and take care of the wetland as well. In the bottom photo, there's a wetland that's been fenced off. Um, and you can see we planted some trees around the edge of the wetland and planted some grasses in there. And the basic idea is to soak up some of the water that, the, that would be a swampy area in the paddock. And then we can have more area for growing crops and take one, take one little area just for the wetland and take care of that wetland right there. Next slide, please. So uh, when I was talking about crops and wetlands and living in an agricultural landscape, um, sometimes our wetlands are dry as well. And this is really important. In the wet phase, it's the aquatic phase. In the dry phase, it's the terrestrial phase. And it's really important that some of our wetlands sort of flip-flop between wet and dry. And because they're sometimes wet and sometimes dry, they can be really important biodiversity hotspots with aquatic animals and terrestrial animals too, and plants as well. Next slide, please. So now that we've got a bit of an idea about what a wetland looks like, what does a wetland actually do? I drew this little cartoon of a wetland in a green rolling hills with the water running through and sort of the brown, boggy, marshy area there in the middle. And um, so if you can imagine, that's a, a model wetland for us today. Next slide, please. Now, when it rains, water will come down into the wetland, maybe from an upstream gully or a stream or a creek or whatever. And this water come, can come into the wetland moving pretty quickly. Because the wetland is boggy and the water can meander through the wetland, it has time to soak down into the soil and slow down the flow of the water. So the water leaving the wetland is moving much slower than the water that's coming into the wetland. And this can be important downstream as it'll slow down the velocity, the, the flow rate of the water, reducing erosion and helping to keep the water clean downstream. Next slide, please. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of the wetlands around here are surrounded by crops. And so water can run off these crops as well. So another important job of the wetlands is to act as a filter and to soak up some of the, the carbons or the nutrients or the pollutants, all of these agricultural inputs that we're deliberately putting on the crops to take care of our farms. Um, but if they run off, then the wetland can capture some of them and act as a filter before the water goes down into the rivers. So it's got another really important job, one to slow down the water, one to act as a filter. Next slide, please. So we can help the wetland do some of its work by planting trees around the edge or keeping the trees and shrubs that are already there. Of course, this is great for biodiversity. We get more bugs and birds and lizards in, in these trees and shrubs in the native vegetation. Also helps to slow down the water going into the wetland 
and helps to improve the strength of that filtering of the carbon and nutrient, nutrients and pollutants and slows down the water coming out of the wetlands. Next slide, please. So as a scientist, I'm um, really interested in what happens in a wetland. And um, one of the things that I've been studying for about the, the last 20 years or so is the food webs. And that's um, kind of the story of how the energy and nutrients get cycled around inside the wetland. Next slide, please. So I um, think about food webs like this. Down at the bottom of the food web are the primary producers. In wetlands, that could be something in the aquatic phase. So it could be algae, green slimy stuff growing in the water, or it could be plants growing around the edge, or it could be plants growing in the water. These primary producers, the vegetation, is eaten by herbivores, such as my favorite, the water bugs. And these are consumed by predators, such as fish, and maybe some other predators, a top predator, like an eagle or a kingfisher or something like that. Next slide, please. There's another part to the food web too, and that's the detritus at the base of the food of this food chain. Detritus is dead or decaying vegetation, so old plants and other um, animals or other organisms. And this detritus can be consumed by detritivores, consumed by other predators, and eventually consumed by a top predator. Now you might have noticed that there's some arrows going between the primary producer food chain and the detritus food chain, and that's what makes this a food web. So there's a lot of links between all of these different components of the food webs, and, and it can get really complicated how they all work together. Next slide, please. So I study all of these different animals that live in wetlands, and I thought I would share, share with you some of my favorites from the food webs that I've seen around in wetlands in this area. First of all, I'd, I'd like to introduce you to a few of my favorite detritivores. Um, so these are the animals that eat dead and decaying vegetation and other organisms. Next slide. Whenever I go out to a wetland, I always find bloodworms. Um, these are small wriggly creatures that live in the mud at the bottom of a wetland. And they um, are called bloodworms because they're red and they look like um, they look like they have blood. So they're, they're red because they have hemoglobin in their bodies to carry oxygen around, just like we have hemoglobin in our blood to carry oxygen. Now, most of these bloodworms are detritivores, but a few of them are predators, depends on the species. Next slide, please. So the bloodworms wriggle around in the mud and the wrigglers wriggle around in the water. They like to live in still water, not flowing water. And they like this still water because they have special snorkels on their heads that pierce the water surface so that they can suck oxygen out of their air and into their bodies. When they grow up, they become mosquitoes. Next slide, please. One of my favorite organisms, uh, these are really beautiful little animals, are the caddisflies. And the ones I have here in the photo are micro caddisflies, they're super tiny. And I think they're really special because they can spin their own silk. The ones you see there have spun little sleeping bags for themselves. I like to think of them as silk purses. Other caddisflies, different species, will create little nets to catch detritus that's moving around in the water, detritus or algae or something else that's good to eat. So they set them up kind of like soccer nets at the end of the soccer field and um, the detritus catches in the net like a soccer ball and then they can pick it off out of the out of the silk, just like a spider would pick a, a fly out of a web. Other species of caddisflies create protective cases to build a safe house, kind of like the way a hermit crab can borrow a shell to create a safe house for itself. The caddisflies might use sticks or leaves, and some even use snail shells to build their little safe houses. Depends on the species. Next slide, please. Uh, next in the food web are the herbivores. So these are the ones that are eating the living vegetation. Next slide, please. 
in the wetlands around here, we always see a lot of um, water boatmen swimming about. And water boatmen are pretty cute and they're pretty abundant as well. So there's always a lot of them. You never find just one water boatman, you always find hundreds together. They have sucking mouth parts. So their mouths, instead of chewing and chomping like you and I, have kind of little straws on them that they can in inject into the vegetation and then suck the juices out of the plants. So they might suck out um, plant juice the way you and I might drink a milkshake. So the, the water boatman you see in the photo here is actually a juvenile. It doesn't have any wings yet. As they grow bigger, their wings will develop. Um, it has little wing buds. Once it's an adult, it will actually have wings folded up over the back of its abdomen. Only the adults can fly. And this is really important because they're early colonizers to wetlands. So when a wetland first floods, uh, maybe it starts raining at the beginning of autumn, these will be the first insects, among the first insects to colonize. So they'll fly from neighboring wetlands or rivers to come and um, live in the new wetland. Next slide, please. Another um, organism that we see, another detritivore that we see quite oh, sorry, herbivore that we see quite often in the wetlands around here are the seed shrimp. And these are teeny tiny microscopic crustaceans that are protected by two shells. So they kind of look like clams, but they're, um, you know, smaller than a match head, but they're actually shrimps. You can see in the photo some of their legs poking out and they can use these legs to crawl along the surface and pick up little bits of detritus or algae to eat. So some of them are herbivores, some of them are detritivores, and some of them are even predators. It depends oh, on the <laughs> So the ones you see here in the photo are white, but occasionally, if you're lucky, you might find a blue one or a green one. And again, it depends on the species. There's a lot of diversity out there. Next slide, please. These are uh, mayflies, which are beautiful organisms, both as the nymphs and the adults. So what we're seeing here is the nymph, and this one's a teenager. It's about to turn into an adult. Mayflies can live for several years as nymphs underwater, and then their adult lifespans are very short. A few species um, have adult lifespans that are only a few minutes, and others uh, a few days or maybe a few weeks. So the adults have wings and they can fly away and mate, and they have to make the most of the short time that they have as adults. The nymphs are kind of cool to me because they have gills along the side of their abdomen. So the abdomen is that area between the back of the legs and the, the start of the tails. And you might be able to notice that on each side of their body, they have little gill flaps along the edge. And they can wiggle these gill flaps about to circulate the water and move oxygen ar around and get some oxygen into their bodies. Pretty cute. Next slide, please. Okay, so the last group I'm gonna talk about this afternoon are the predators. And everybody loves the predators because they're really amazing to look at. They always look like alien creatures. Next slide, please. One of my favorite animals in the whole wide world are the mud skippers. And I love these guys for a lot of different reasons. Um, one of the reasons is that they're juvenile dragonflies. And I think dragonflies are just beautiful animals. The other reason is that they're really vicious predators. They're very aggressive and have um, some amazing superpowers, a couple of different superpowers that make them such good predators. The first um, superpower they have is at their front end. They have a modified bottom lip that they use for grabbing swimming prey. So instead of just a regular bottom lip, the, it's kind of modified into a pair of baseball gloves that they can use to stretch out and grab some prey swimming by. So if they see something delicious, they'll use these like an extra pair of hands to grab that prey and jam it back into their mouth. And they can still walk around on their legs without having to um, worry about grabbing something to eat. So they're very um, fast moving bottom lip that they can use to grab it and pull it back into their mouth. The second superpower that they have is their ability to move really fast. So they can walk around on their legs, but when they see something swimming by that's moving fast, they can move 
extra fast by using a little bit of jet propulsion. They squirt a little bit of water out their butts and it pushes them forward to grab that prey item and move really fast. Next slide, please. A lot of beetles are um, predators as well, and this is a beetle larva. So in terrestrial systems, we call beetle larvae grubs, but in aquatic systems, we usually just call them larvae. So many of the beetle larvae are predators and some are herbivores, but the one here you can see is clearly a predator. They have really big mouth parts that are used for grabbing, biting and chewing. And you can see those huge mandibles that are holding onto the fish, getting ready to eat it. That's a predaceous diving beetle. And again, they're pretty aggressive predators too. Some beetles also have legs that are shaped like flippers to help them move fast in the water so that they can chase after prey. Next slide, please. The last predator that I wanted to show you is not technically a predator. It's actually a parasite, but I thought I would include it because it's um, a kind of an obvious part of wetlands around here. And I was bitten by a leech last week, which wasn't fun. Um, so luckily though, leeches only feed one or two times every year. So if you get bitten by a leech, you can know pretty sure that it's not gonna bite anybody else for at least another six months. So leeches look magnificent under a microscope. They have these amazing mouths with big sharp teeth. And they also have these pretty strong suckers at the back end. They use their mouths with the sharp teeth to um, cut into the skin of an animal like me or you. And then they squirt a little bit of anticoagulant into that wound. And the anticoagulant is a special kind of juice that they make to make your blood run faster. So they can slurp up as much blood as possible as quickly as possible. Now leeches make a bit of a mess because they're making your blood go everywhere, but they're actually quite harmless and don't hurt too bad, I promise. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was a few of my um, favorite water bugs and I hope a few of your favorites were in there too. I also hope that um, in the next couple of weeks that you get a chance to go outside and do some water bug spotting of your own. When you do go out, I really wanna encourage you to handle the bug gently and be respectful. These are animals and you've gotta be uh, careful with them. I also really encourage you to take a photo and record some of the details of what you've seen, such as what you've seen, where you've seen it, and when you've seen it. And you can use a different app or uh, join a citizen science project to record your information so that we have a better understanding of the biodiversity in our wetlands, because there's really not a lot of information available about what's on our farms and in our wetlands. You can also try and identify it for yourself. So there's some good resources available online, like these um, uh, pictures I'm showing you here from River Detectives and the um, Waterbug Blitz. Um, they have some great resources online for, for you. Um, you can also give me a call and, and send me a photo if you have something interesting to share. And I also, Personally, I also use iNaturalist a lot as well. So I'll take a photo and upload it and share it with the iNaturalist community to help confirm my IDs too. And I think Ilya is gonna talk a little bit more about iNaturalist in her talk as well. So if you have any questions, I would love to hear them. If you have some favorite bugs, I would love to hear about it too. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jelena. Thanks, Asha, that was great. Um, I haven't had any questions come through the chat, but if anyone has a question that would they like to ask Asha, please do so now. And I think um, uh, the resources I showed at the end there, I sent them to Jelena as well. So um, she'll be able to share them out with everyone. So you've got to, the, the key and the water bug chart that you can use at home as well. Definitely. Sure will, Asha. Uh, and no, uh, no questions for Asha? We can move on. Ilya, hand over to you to talk all things frogs. Yep. Hi, everybody. Just share my screen. 
All righty. Um, my name's Ilya. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about frogs on the volcanic plains. I've worked um, as a field researcher for the last nine or so years in Australia, which just means I go out into the field and survey for all manner of different kinds of species. Um, frogs, uh, reptiles, insects are some of my specialties. And so today I was just going to share with you some tips for how to go out and do frog surveys because you'll find it's not particularly um, specialty kind of thing and um, anyone can really go out there and do it themselves and um, get data, which is valuable because there's just not enough researchers out there um, to visit all the different wetland sites across Victoria. But before I share some of these tips, I wanted to just really briefly start with the story of the frog because it's a cool story and it starts a lot earlier than you might expect because it starts about 100 million years before we even had dinosaurs present on the planet. And this is the Devonian period. And about 370 million years ago, we get the ancestor to the frog. And it looks a bit like a um, fish with four legs. Um, and this is the start of the group of species um, that we now know as amphibians. If we want to see an actual frog, because this doesn't look really at all like a frog, we only need to fast forward another 100 million years or so into um, peak dinosaur period. This is the late Cretaceous where we've got brachiosaurs and pterodactyls in the sky. And this is actually our earliest um, fossil evidence of a frog that really looks like a frog. This is a 99 million year old frog trapped in amber. And you can see that if it was hopping around today, you probably wouldn't be able to distinguish it from modern frogs. So there's a little frog face and front legs here. And then from there, another 99 million years of evolution brings us to the current state of frogs um, with over 3000 different species of frogs and toads across the globe. Um, 200 in Australia, and you can see that they're present on every continent except for Antarctica. And the secret to the success um, of these frog species is that they have amazing adaptability. They have evolved to live absolutely anywhere that there is fresh water. Um, they have found that sweet spot between being totally aquatic and being totally terrestrial. And when we think of what's a good um, habitat for this um, half aquatic, half terrestrial species, we tend to think of something like this, a beautiful lush wetland. And you would be spot on because this is prime frog habitat with a whole bunch of species that would love to call this um, wetland home. But what if we think about a habitat like this? Surely that's not a good place to find a frog. Um, probably not a lot of fresh water present there. But sure enough, you could find the Australian water holding frog in a place like this, which deals with the fact that water is not always present by burying under the ground, sometimes for up to seven years, waiting for the rain to come, at which point it comes up above the ground, um, sings and, and reproduces, and then heads back, heads back underground to stay safe in a cocoon made of its own shed skin. And then how about a habitat like this? Looks pretty cold for a, a frog. We know they are quote unquote cold blooded. They can't create their own heat. Surely they don't want to live in the snowy mountains. But again, that's a picture of Mount Baba and we've got the Mount Baba frog who calls that home. And that's not even the most extreme winter frog. There's a frog called the wood frog that lives in the Arctic Circle. And it can actually be frozen solid because it has a special compound in its blood, acts like antifreeze, protects its organs while the rest of the body freezes. So um, long story short, frogs are incredibly diverse and incredibly adaptable. And with all that flexibility, you'd think there's very little that should stop frogs from enjoying another 99 million years on the planet. But as it stands, frogs are the most threatened class of vertebrates in the world. And a third of our frog species globally are threatened with extinction. And there's a lot of different things that contribute to threats facing frogs. One of um, the big ones is um, habitat loss as a result of the growth of cities and waterways being altered by, by city growth. Um, we get changes in climate can be, um, changes in climate causing changes in water temperature. Um, pollution or changes in water quality as well can be very um, detrimental to frogs. Um, the introduction of predators and a really big one is actually the spread of disease. And in particular, there's one disease called chytrid. Um, which has spread across the globe and is really one of the absolute leading causes of decline for frogs. And that's, I think, I think most people would agree that 
it's a shame to lose frogs. Frogs are really cool species. Um, I don't think you have to think too hard about reasons why we'd like them to stick around. Um, but besides just being amazing, awesome looking animals, um, full of colors and, and beautiful songs, they're really important members of the food web. As Asha has already sort of talked about these really intricate connections, um, frogs kind of sit in the middle um, as a middleman of all these different connections. When they're a tadpole, they, um, they feast on algae, keeping algae under control and algal blooms can be really bad for waterway health because um, they can disrupt oxygen levels. But then the tadpoles also are food for a whole bunch of other critters like water bug, <laughs> the voracious water bug larvae right there, um, fish and turtles and birds and, and even other frogs. And without frogs, we'd have a lot more of these guys around. So I think we can all thank the frog for keeping our mosquito populations under control um, because tadpoles love feasting on those little wrigglers and prevent this from being our, our um, future. <laughs> So here on the volcanic plains, um, we've got several species of frogs that you might be able to go out and find in your own waterways. Um, I'll just be focusing on species um, present in this region, but a lot of the common ones um, are the same species I used to survey for around Melbourne. I also find out here um, near Ararat, so they, um, they stretch across the whole range. And these are just some of the common frog species. Um, this is from the, um, there's a great online field guide made by Ecolink called Grasslands um, Biodiversity of Southeastern Australia. You can read about all these different frogs, get some fun facts, um, find their locations, but I'll, I will take you through a couple of the, of the common ones and what they sound like. Now, before you go out and do a survey, um, you really want to practice a call, and that's because a large part of doing a frog survey is listening rather than actually seeing. Um, the Frog ID app is made by Australian Museum, and I'll, I'll come back to it a little bit um, later, but it's a great repository. If you open it up, you can play all sorts of calls, hear what they sound like, try and commit the common ones to memory. I also love this um, Frog Census app. Um, this is actually just a local one, just focused on Melbourne, so it's a bit more like a, a field guide, um, but you can find um, the most common species around the volcanic plains in there as well and play their calls. And so some of the common species that you might want to become familiar with, um, we've got here the southern brown tree frog, and I'm actually going to play the call right here on my phone. So hopefully you can hear. This one um, is a sound that you, you hear filling the night um, a lot of places. They have this um, characteristic dark stripe through their eye and a little white, white um, cheek. We have the common froglet. Um, this is another really, um, really easy to, to find frog. Not easy to spot, but easy to hear. Sounds a bit like a cricket. And it has a very closely related cousin called the Eastern sign bearing froglet, which looks almost identical, but sounds very different. And this is one of my favorite frog calls. A little kind of squashed squeak sound. The spotted marsh frog is also another. Um, there are a few ways to oh, for frogs. oh dear! One of the I did not realize I had some audio on that slide. My apologies, guys. At the water's edge at night. Um, but you do need to make sure you're visiting. I'm the gonna site. pause that share real quick, and bear with me for one moment. I apologize for that. At the right time of the year for the frogs that you're surveying for. Let me just pop out and. Oh, there's that pesky little recording. <laughs> and now let's pop back in. Okay, slide. And we will reshare. All right, we're back in business. Sorry about that, guys. Um, this is the spotted marsh frog. Um, really characteristic white stripe down the back. The rest of the patterns of this frog can be quite varied. Um, sometimes the spottiness looks more stripy and looks more like the striped marsh frog. But here's its call. Sounds a bit like if you clicked two rocks together. And so you can go through the app and you can um, play a lot of these different calls and try and get familiar with them ahead of time. It's also cool to be aware of what um, the threatened species in your area sound like, because if you find them, that can be really exciting. And our, um, our threatened frog in the volcanic plains region is also our largest frog, and it's the growling grass frog. And it's actually a tree frog, even though it's about the size of your hand. Um, and I 
do, you sometimes find it sitting up um, in pretty high bushes and trees that you wouldn't expect. And its call um, certainly matches its name. It's a very deep growl. So those are just some common ones to get you started. If you kind of have those calls committed to memory, you'll make a really good start. So now I'll give you some tips for how you actually do a survey. And like I said before, it's actually a pretty simple process that anyone can do. The first step is having your tools. Um, all you really need is a flashlight, your phone, get your app loaded ahead of time. Uh, make sure you download the calls before you go down to the waterway if you're not gonna have internet down there. Um, and you'll need this white sheet of paper and I'll come back to that. You can just put it in your pocket. And then you need a clean pair of boots. And it's really important that the boots are not just clean and free of um, seeds. You don't wanna be spreading seeds of weeds around, but they need to be disinfected. And that comes back to what I mentioned before about the chytrid fungus being the biggest cause of frog declines. It's a fungus that spreads really easily. It, it spreads right on your shoes. If you've walked anywhere where there's this chytrid in the soil, it just hops a ride on your shoes to new waterways. So every time you go from one waterway to another, we would use a boot dip. Um, and this is just plastic tub full of a dilute mix of bleach and water. And we would dip our boots in and clean them off between each site. So it's a really important um, thing to be doing if you wanna go around surveying um, different waterways. Then the next step is to pick a good night. Um, frogs like it best when it's a warm night um, after a sunny day, um, the temperature at night isn't getting above 12 degrees. There's not any wind or there's only a little bit of wind. It's really good if it's rained recently, especially if you wanna see one of those species that comes up out of the ground, like the spade foot or trilling frog it's called. Um, and you just wait about 30 minutes after sunset. And you will start hearing frogs calling even earlier than that, but you'll get the best, um, the best results if you wait till it's dark. And the first step is to just turn off all your lights and listen quietly for at least five minutes to give the frogs time to um, get used to your presence and so that you can listen for what species um, are there singing. And so um, this is a little recording I took. I want a head volume. So if you could hear, there was two different frogs calling there. And you might recognize them from the um, calls I played a little bit earlier. That's the sign-bearing froglet and the common froglet. And take a recording um, as you're sitting there listening quietly. And you can do that through the Frog ID app and actually upload it um, to take part in a Australia-wide citizen science collection. Um, and this is a really great thing to do um, because frogs, as I kind of mentioned before, they um, they're sensitive to quite a lot of changes in the water. And that's because um, frogs are actually, um, they have a skin that absorbs pretty much everything from the water. They breathe through their skin, they drink through their skin. Anything in the water, um, um, any changes in water quality or water health affects them really quickly. And that means they're like our early warning species if anything is going wrong in our waterways. And so this project, the Frog ID project, um, is great because like I said before, there's not enough of us field scientists to be out there all the time surveying for frogs. Um, and so this is a way that you can actually contribute to tracking our frog populations and helping us um, make sure we catch any um, problems early. And I won't um, take you through the step-by-step -step because um, Frog ID has made a really great um, tutorial video and I can share that in the chat. Um, but this is what the app looks like. You can take a recording while you're there listening to the frogs and you can scroll through some calls to try and ID what you found. Now, once you've taken your recording um, and you've, you've had a quiet listen, so you know which frogs are singing, um, there might also be frogs there who are not singing, who are maybe a bit shy or it's not really the time of year that they sing much, but you can sometimes trick them into singing by making them think that there's others of their same species around. And we used this trick a lot back when I did frog surveys around Melbourne. Um, particularly if the frog's feeling a bit territorial or is looking for a mate. If he hears a call, then he might respond. And so this is a little video um, I was trying to get, I know I had pubble bonks around, but I was trying to get them to call. So I play just the first two notes from a pubble bonk sound, um, which I'll just play ahead of time so you know what you're listening for. And then 
Anytime you hear a third tone, that's an actual frog calling back to me. So this is what the, what the phone app call sounds like. You could hear that. See those two tones? Now I'm gonna play um, the recording. So this is the background sound. The public bunk was quiet. So that's that's a really fun way to try and get some um, some of the quieter calls frogs to call back to you. Now, once you've done your listening, you can turn your torches on and you can actually go have a have a search for the frogs because it's always fun to get to actually see them. And do remember that they're not just going to be found floating around in the water. Um, the water they might be um, hiding in little mud caves around the edge. Um, they might be sitting right out in the open. Growling grass frogs are notorious for just sitting up on a rock. Um, they might be hiding under the leaf litter. They might be out in the grass or on a lawn. Um, and they might be up in high vegetation or up in trees. They can be pretty small and camouflaged, even though they make really big sounds. And this is just an example. So you might see him there. Just as we zoom out, you can see how tiny he is compared to my boots. And they make, they make a pretty good sound, loud sound for how little they are. Uh, just be careful as you walk around the water body, make sure you're not disturbing any habitats. Um, if it's, if it's um, hard to try and pinpoint where these frogs are coming from, it helps to have a couple friends. You can each stand in a different location and triangulate a call. You all slowly walk closer to where you think the frog's calling and it'll get you in right about um, the right sort of spot. And then if you want to try and find the frog and it's quite camouflaged, a trick that we also used on frog surveys, which can be really great, is to look for eye shine. Um, and this is, if you ever, catch your dog's eyes in the flashlight at night, they shine back really bright yellow. It's like that, just a bit, a bit dimmer, um, but you can look for that light reflecting from your torch off of um, the eyes of the frog, especially if you're using a head torch or you're holding your flashlight up here in line with your eyes. And this video gives you um, a sense of what that looks like. You might see this little glimmer here. A little flicker of light in the video. So that's eye shine. However, this is not from a frog and the vast majority of eyes you're gonna see sparkling in the night do not come from frogs. And as you get closer, you might be able to have a guess as to whose eyes are causing that sparkle. And if you haven't guessed yet, it is a wolf spider. These guys have the sparkliest, brightest eyes you'll ever see at night. And they're constantly throwing you off thinking you found something a lot bigger. <laughs> All right, just about the last step now is you found your frog. Um, you want to get a picture so you can upload it to um, iNaturalist, um, the citizen science photo app. Um, here's just another tip that I um, use to take pictures of frogs. Um, and that is turn off your camera's flash and dampen your torch. And this is what the white sheet of paper is for. Um, I'll just play this little demo. Fold the paper and flashlights. This makes it much nicer um, to shine in someone's eyes. Um, you can put it right in your own eyes and you'll see it's a lot, it's a lot um, more dim and diffuse. You can see the little frog there is still calling. He's not too fussed at all. And then you can sneak in there really slowly and get your picture. And so by using that white paper um, to just dampen the light from your flashlight, it's nicer for the frog's eyes, but also you get a much nicer picture with a bit more diffuse light, you get the color better. So it's a good way to take your photos at night. And of course, the last step is reporting your findings because all of those records you make, um, it just, it, um, it exponentially increases the amount of data that scientists have available to work with when they're trying to um, tackle problems like frog declines. And so every frog you record by call um, through the Frog ID app or the Frog Census app, 
and every photo you upload to iNaturalist is extremely valuable data. And I'll just speak really briefly now about iNaturalist. Um, and there's also great tutorials already available for this, so I won't I won't reinvent the wheel here. Um, and we'll share I'll share this link in the chat. But this is an app that lets you submit photos rather than calls. Um, so you can see I've submitted this picture here of a frog I took the other night. And the great thing about this app is it helps you with your identifications. It doesn't matter if you don't know what the frog is. You upload it and the app makes a guess and it does a really good job. It actually nailed it right here. This is indeed um, the common froglet. Um, and this is just based off of the, the internal algorithm of the app. And then from there, you also get um, just a whole bunch of people who use the app, taxonomists, scientists, um, and just naturalist enthusiasts. And they find your photos and then they help you with your IDs even further by adding identifications. So all these little pink tags is where someone's helped me with one of my photos telling me what it is. Um, and there's a lot of different bioblitzes you can get involved in through this app. Um, at the end of this month, there's the Great Southern Bioblitz coming up, so you can use these frog ID tips and add your frog records just in time for that. And that's, um, that's all I've got, but um, I guess just because it's hard not to be fascinated by a leech, this was not coordinated, but I also ended with um, a leech video because I wanted to emphasize that even if you don't find frogs, um, you might hear a lot of them singing, but don't be disheartened if you can't find them because there's so many other really cool things you can find in the water, like this leech, which I've never seen one do this like this, but it was hanging off the surface of the water as if the water was a glass ceiling and just scooting along like an inchworm upside down. <laughs> so I'll leave that like that and see if anyone has questions. Thanks, Elia. Um, I've had none come through the chat, but if anyone's got a question, feel free to speak up and ask away. Hey, Elia, I've got a question. Yeah. <laughs> Is it okay to hold the frogs, pick them up and hold them? Thank you. That was in my notes and I forgot to say it. Um, when you do find a frog, um, just take photos and look with your eyes. Um, we never, ever want to pick up the frogs. The reason being one, imagine you were a tiny frog and what you perceive as a huge and threatening predator picks you up, that's going to be extremely stressful and frogs don't deal very well with stress. So for one, it's terrifying for the frog. But even more importantly, um, what I said about frog skin being quite, um, quite sensitive and can absorb pretty much anything because they breathe through it and they drink through it. If there's anything on your hands, if you've got chemicals or bacteria or if you've touched water that has chytrid, you spread it right onto the frog. So even, even frog surveyors, we never, we never touch them um, unless absolutely necessary because it's just really bad for their health. I see, I see a question popped up about chytrid. How widespread is chytrid in the VVP? This is a really interesting one. Um, so chytrid is pretty much everywhere across the whole globe right now, but it, it's a fungus that can't survive under all conditions. It does best when it's cold, um, it also doesn't do very good when water gets a bit saltier. So chytrid is actually a much bigger problem in the Melbourne um, urban area than it is out here on the volcanic plains um, further west because the water um, can be a bit, a bit more salty, and a bit more brackish, and that's not very good for chytrid. So for instance, growling grass frogs are a species that are affected by chytrid, and they actually do quite a bit better out here in the West on the plains than they're doing in the city. And that's for a few reasons, but the chytrid is, the fact that chytrid flare-ups um, happen more in the Melbourne area is one of them. But always assume it's everywhere um, because it's just very widespread at this point. So Ilya, we had another question come through. Um, how can we provide more habitat to frogs in our own backyard? Mm. So that's a really good one. And I have a friend who just, um, I know he's online now, um, got started with his own frog pond in his backyard. Um, there's re some really great resources. And actually I'll, um, I'll, include, um, I'll include a couple, um, we can share some resources in the chat if I'm very quick about pulling it up. But for frog habitat, what you want is um, still water. They need water that's not flowing too fast um, where they can lay their eggs. This is why they like the sides of creeks that are moving pretty slow. They want a bit of vegetation. So if you can create a pond 
but put some plants in. This sort of gives, um, this helps with the temperature of the water because it creates more shade. So the sun's not just baking on the water all day, it gives them places to hide so that they're a bit more safe from predators. Um, so you really just want to create a, something that looks like those wetland pictures um, that Asha was showing you. A lot of plants, um, you want to attract in insects because that's the food for the frogs. And if you do want to set up a little frog pond, I definitely recommend you do a little survey first. Try and figure out what frogs you have before you do any alterations. Um, because then, as you start setting up your pond, putting in more vegetation, trying to create those little microhabitats, those nice little cool, um, diverse areas, then you'll start seeing the frogs come and you can start recording them. But um, I'll, 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 share, I'll share, if not in the chat before we hang up, um, through the Facebook group, I'll share some guides for how to make a really good frog pond. So we had another question there earlier about, um, should we purchase water plants in case they have the fungus in the soil? That's a really good question. Um, could depend, I guess, on, on, where, on where you're sourcing them from. Um, I'm not sure I have a, have a great answer as to, as to how often you'd be getting um, chytrid fungus shared in the potting soil of a water plant. I will, um, maybe that's one I can look into and we can share um, afterwards. I mean, it's good to be, it's good to be thinking of that, but I'm not sure really how you would, how you would avoid um, not purchasing plants because you don't want to go dig them up out of the wild either. Yeah. Wonderful. Any last questions for Elia? No more questions? All righty. So we're getting close to our finishing time, but I had a couple of things uh, before we finished up. Um, for those that are interested, we will be sending out information packs, um, which will include some handy resources. So both Elia and Asher have had um, a few that they've mentioned. So if you'd like to receive one, um, please email me at beyondbolak at outlook.com and I could post them out to you in the next couple of weeks. Otherwise, we will add all the resources to Beyond Bollock's website um, where you'll be able to download them and print them out. Um, also, if you get a chance, visit the Wallora Wetlands. Uh, Beyond Bollock have a series of interactive frog signs set up um, where you can push a button and listen to the calls um, of all the local frog species and there's some information on the signs about them all. Um, and if it's warm night, you might hear some frogs calling back to you as uh, Elias mentioned. Also, um, to stay up to date on what Beyond Bollocks are doing and other events, please visit our website or Facebook page. Uh, we also would love to see what you might find out there. Um, so you can either email them through to me or um, tag Beyond Bollocks uh, page if you post them online. Um, as I said, we would love to see what's out there and also um, add them to iNaturalist um, is another great way. So that concludes our Frogging on the Victorian Volcanic Plains workshop today. Thanks for joining us. Big thank you to Elia and Asha for sharing their wealth of knowledge on water bugs and frogs. We hope that you found it informative and have inspired you to get out and explore your local wetlands and water holes to see what you may find. Asha and Elia, did you have any final words? I've just popped in the frog um, habitat resource made by Melbourne Water. They also have a really good frog ID guide. Um, and also Beth Mellick in the chat did point out, um, I'll share the link to this as well. Um, Australian Museum really wants you to get onto that frog ID app using it because there are um, some kind of unexplained frog deaths happening at the moment. They're trying to get a handle on it. It's hard for their researchers to get out surveying because of COVID. So they're feeling a little bit in the dark here with data. Um, so the more people are getting onto the Frog ID app and recording their findings, it really helps um, them determine what's, um, what's going on and, and um, if anything's going wrong um, with frog populations. So I've just shared that link as well. Thanks, Celia. Uh, so the recording of the session, uh, we'll put it up on our, um, we've got a YouTube channel uh, and I'll also share it, um, share that link via Facebook um, for everyone. Uh, Asha, did you have any final words? Uh, not really. Just I'm really glad to see so many people here um, who are interested in our wetlands and our water bugs and our frogs. And I really do hope that you go out and explore 
and be careful when you go and keep your boots clean and everything. Um, but send me any questions you have. I, I love seeing photos too, and I'll keep an eye on Beyond Bolac with Jelena as well. Thanks, everyone. Wonderful.